you're watching Reason and Theology Live, a show dedicated to charitable discussion, debates, interviews, commentary, and analysis. The show concentrates on theological topics, historical matters, and philosophical problems with content ranging from introductory material to in-depth examinations. And now, your host, Michael Locke. Welcome back to the show, everybody. Your host, Michael, on a Thursday evening, doing our second stream for the night. Cultural and social factors in the East-West schism coming up with Timothy Flanders from The Meaning of Catholic. Y'all make sure to go check it out. Subscribe if y'all haven't already. And, of course, my co-host Eric Ibarra is going to be joining us. So, again, Timothy Flanders, Eric Ibarra, cultural and social factors in the East-West schism coming up next. Timothy, welcome to the show. How are you? Christ is risen. Doing very well. Great to see you. Yeah, it's been a while since we've had you on. Good to have you back. Yeah, you've uh, upped the aesthetic of the show. A little bit. uh, (laughs) Taking it to the next level here. (laughs) Trying to. How are you, Eric? I'm doing excellent. Glad glad to be on again. I love the headset. (laughs) Thank you. Keeps your hands free for fighting. Right. (laughs) So let's do it. Let's go ahead and dive in wherever you want to go with this, Timothy. Uh, Take it. Sure. Yeah. Well, I've been uh, just finished my second book, and the book is called Uniting Conservatives and Traditionalists, The Spiritual History of Catholic Culture. And it is an attempt to synthesize the two greatest historians to provide a context for the current crisis in the Catholic Church. So the, the book is actually trying to address with a, a long drawn out history, trying to address the current situation that we face in the 20th century Catholic church. But I uncovered a lot of things that I didn't realize, didn't know about regarding the Greek schism, the mm-hmm. Eastern Orthodox split between the Roman Catholics, which your viewers are very familiar with, and a number of factors which are not often discussed. And so that's what I'm gonna present tonight, think some of the things that I found. Um, So that starts off with the idea of what is culture and what is society, because a lot of people today talk about culture. They say our culture is the culture of death and, you know, what is our culture and all sorts of things. But the term culture, I submit here that the term culture colloquially used is misused and to our detriment, um, because culture is a very deep term with a lot of meaning to it. And in trying to synthesize uh, the work of much greater and erudite men than I to try to address the situation, um, there's basically a dichotomy in a people. And you see this everywhere you go, any any people you go to, uh, any people in the world, any history you look at, you see the same pattern and it's really a result of natural law. And so peoples are forming in themselves, people are coming together and they have a body and a soul and the soul directs the body just like in a person but there is a people and the people is a gathered together of families and the culture forms the soul and the society is that which is uh going after sort of the natural ends of the people so i have this graphic can you put this thing on the i don't know if you i don't think i can share that okay there it is make it bigger okay so this is this is basically what you see in every people whether you're in europe history of Europe, history of African civilization, South American civilization, every civilization follows this pattern because it's natural law. And so you have culture and there's four elements of culture. There's the cultus, which is the religious right of a people. You have the tradition, which is passed down. You have the elders, which pass down the tradition. And then you have piety, which is where the next generation receives it and passes it down. So this is everywhere you look, this is what you see. And you see that this culture governs the society of the people. This is what informs their morals, everything from morals to the way they dance, to the way that they eat their food, to the way that they understand economy, they understand family life, morals, and the government. So this is the framework that is followed by peoples, by just the inclinations of natural law. So what we observe in the affliction of original sin, we observe that the demons were not able to actually break per se, this this genera- generativity, this passing down of culture for until most recently they were able to break it, but that's another story for another show. Um, what they were able to do was corrupt 
the culture. They were able to infiltrate the cultists, the religious rite, so that the demons could be worshipped as gods. And that could then be passed down. And we see this in Genesis chapter 4. When the cultists, so Adam is cast out of the garden, Adam and Eve, and they are giving the tradition, presumably they're giving, they're teaching their children. And they, they have Cain and Abel, and Abel off, makes an offering. So he's offering a cultist. Cain also offers a cultist, but he doesn't offer it rightly. And so he is rejected. But instead of repenting, as the Lord himself at, calls him to repent and join his brother Abel, he enforces his will by killing Abel. And he's basically the inventor of the first new religion, basically, by this act of Cain. And what this is introducing into culture is no longer an elder who's piously passing down what Adam gave him, his father. He's imposing his will on the cultists, on the, the religious right himself. He's, he's killing his brother. And then he's saying, I will then build a city after the name of my son. I will sort of create my own thing. I will impose my own will. And this is what, so this is why the church, as we'll see in a minute, when they encounter other cultures, they encounter more or less a corruption of demons in their religious rites. Some cultures are far more uh, following natural law, uh, especially if they're not an empire. They're not as much worshiping demons. There may be some demonic folk elements and whatnot. So the, the baptism of that culture is relatively easy. So there's less demonic corruption in, in a culture like that much more, you can see this in more tribal cultures, which are less imperial, but the more imperial civilizations have far more demonic content, especially when you look at things like the Greco-Roman civilization. And you can also see this, like, for example, the Aztecs, you know, you have human sacrifice. Um, you have this, obviously, in the Canaanite civilizations, the human sacrifice. So you have this very strong demonic content, which is very resistant to the gospel. So, why are we talking all about this for the Greek rescism? Well, I'm getting to that in just a minute. Um, what we see, so we see this corruption of cultists with the worship of demons. What Cain is, is a new type of elder. He's the priest king. He's the one who imposes his will, not the will of the cultists, what is passed down from Adam. He imposes his will on it. So he asserts his own power over this religious right passed down. And this is what you see in these great civilizations. So you see it in Greece and you see it in Persia and you see it in Rome. You see this office of the priest king and the priest king imposes his will. Another example is Pharaoh. He's imposing his will. He's basically the God or the son of God or the high priest or all three. And he's essentially imposing his will. And what he's trying to do is he's preventing the logos contained in the cultists being passed down all the way from Adam from guiding him according to natural law. So he's trying to resist natural law basically by becoming this sort of priest figure. So you see this, this is the corruption of the cultists that you also see, which promotes this demonic worship. So we're going to get to, I'm going to, we're going to get into Greco Roman in just a minute, but you see the typology of these things or these archetypes in the Holy scriptures. First, you see in the way that the culture is set up in Mosaic law, you see uh, the way God sets it up. He sets up 12 distinct tribes, and there's actually 13 because there's a half tribe of Manassas, and they all are different races. They don't intermarry, and they actually start to speak different languages. You see that in the book of Judges. They're speaking different dialects, so they're developing different languages. So they're basically these different cultures within one there are different peoples within one greater people, which follows one cultist. So there's one priesthood. There's this elder. So there's this, all this setup. You see it perfected or being perfected in the Mosaic law. But you also see the priest king figure of, arise. So first, as, as we know, Israel rejects God as king and they want a king. And this is the figure of the priest king because God does not impose a king on them. He himself is the king. So you have the local rulers of every tribe. You have the princes of every tribe who are the military leaders. And then you have the high priest who's doing the cultists. And then God himself is the king. There is no more greater uh, political figure over uh, the people of Israel until they ask for a king. And so, and they, and um, he says, the Lord says to Samuel, they have rejected me as king. And so they, 
initiate this priest king process and what you see finally uh is that god concedes to it because he is he is going to bring about the incarnation but the priest figures arise at the split of the kingdom and you see two figures you see roboam and jeroboam and one of them roboam is simply he's sort of orthodox roboam the son of solomon so the so solomon builds the temple and there's this tension because he enslaves the people um, but his son, they ask his son to lighten the load. And he says, no, I'm not going to lighten the load. I'm going to scourge you with scorpions. So this, it's the split in the kingdom happens. And then you see the figure of this, this priest king. And this is what's going to give us a picture of what will happen with the Greek schism right here. Because this is going to be followed by the Roman emperor in just a few minutes. You have Roboam on the one hand who is the priest king who just, he's hes orthodox. He's got the high priesthood of, of uh, Moses, of the sons of Aaron. He's got the divigate line. He's got all the orthodoxy, but he's not morally following the Mosaic law. He's enslaving his brethren, which is against the Mosaic law. And so he's not morally following. He's still imposing his will on the cultists because he's not following the cultists. And then you have Jeroboam, who's actually inventing his own cultists. So he sets up the the calf, the golden calf in Bethel, he creates the Samaritan religion. So he's creating a new religion. So these two archetypes give us the two pictures of the Roman emperors that we see in, in Roman history. Some Roman emperors in the Christian period were entirely orthodox, but they were still exercising a priest-king role. And the priest-king role arises with the Pontifex Maximus in the Roman religion. So I'm going to get to that in just a minute. But what you see at the incarnation, you see at the incarnation, you see God's providence creating a synthesis of cultures to bring about the incarnation. Because right at the moment when the incarnation happens, there's a synthesis being born called Greco-Roman civilization. Greco-Roman civilization is a synthesis between two civilizations, the greatest civilizations at that time, Greece and Rome. And what we see, there's another factor here that's that's often missed in the history, and that's Persia. Persia is the other great empire of that time. And the what we see in this history coming up to the incarnation is we see the birthing of a right of the priest king. Priest king creates his own right to worship himself, and that's under Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great conquers the Persians. Now, the Greeks, the great greatness of the Greeks is in their philosophy, in their literature, in their thirst for what is true, good, and beautiful. This is why God chose the Greek language to write the New Testament. Only the Greek language can say, in arche in ho logos, in the beginning was the logos, in the beginning was the word. There's, I mean, you could maybe say it in Chinese or Sanskrit, but you certainly can't say it in Latin. Uh, in era, uh, what is it? In Principio Erat Verbum, Verbum does not encompass the depth of the term logos. And as you know, as your viewers know, there's been immense Christological controversy ever since because the word is so deep. There's so many different aspects to these different Greek words. And there was blood shed spilled over all these different Greek words because the, the language is so deep. And so God chose the Greek language to try to express the depth of the divine mystery of the Holy Trinity, divine ministry of the incarnation. The Greek language is what can express that. The Hebrew language cannot express that as well as the Greek. But the Greeks under, under Alexander the Great, they conquer Persia. Now, Persia's greatness was in its great administrative power. It was able to administrate this great empire, this ancient empire. But the Greeks did not have that gift of great administration and unity. And this is another factor that we can even see today. And we see very quickly the Greek schisms between all the different Greek parties. Greeks, the, the Greek language does not afford a great administrative mind of unity. Even in the golden age, golden age of the Greek civilization, uh, with the great city-states, Athens, Sparta, and the Peloponnesian War, you have these great Greek civilizations that are all at war with each other, and then Alexander the Great unites them all, and they conquer all the way to India, but then they immediately break into a thousand pieces. 
And that's because the Greek mind conquers the Persian mind, the Persian mind, which has the unity. And so there's never a synthesis that is able to come about be with the Persians. And that becomes a bigger factor later on, which I'll get to in a minute. I'm, I'm just going really super fast here. So if you want to cut in at any time to clarify anything, I got to take a drink of water. No, you're, you're good so far. I'm, I'm definitely listening. Okay, sweet. Um, so there's not a synthesis that is made with the Greeks and Persians. Now, the Persian Empire is a, a massive factor that goes all the way up to the Mohammedan conquest, which is almost entirely missed today because there's still a bias in history that's been passed down for the Romans. So the Persians are seen as this fierce enemy because Alexander the Great, he conquers the Persians and he is the Persian king is a rival priest king. And his term, his title is king of kings. That's his chosen title, the Persian king. Now, Alexander's chosen title is son of God. So you have these titles that are being used to express this corruption of the priest king. And these are the titles that are given to our Lord in the New Testament, both King of Kings and Son of God. So, uh, but here's what here's what's interesting you see here culturally is that Alexander the Great does the right of triumph. It is a religious right where he is triumph. It's basically a parade, but parades today don't have anything like the meaning they did at that time because this triumph, this right of triumph, it's a religious right it was, it is uh, believed. It was believed to be have done by the god Dionysus. He did the first rite of triumph, and so Alexander the Great is the is the new Dionysus. He's doing this rite of triumph where you you process in a parade, you parade your enemies in front of you, and then you kill them, and in this massive festival, and everyone's there, and it's this huge religious ritual. And then he, Alexander the Great, takes on the title King of Kings because he's conquered the Persian king. He takes his title. But because the Greek mind does not have that administrative unity, it breaks apart with the sons of Alexander. And, and there's no synthesis that is really made between the Persians and the Greeks. Maybe if the Persians had conquered the Greeks, we'd have a Persian Greek synthesis because the Persians could actually administrate an empire. They could have unity with the Persian mind. But in God's providence, it was the Romans who conquered the Greeks. And so the Romans have that same Persian skill of administration. That is the greatness of the Romans. The Romans are not great at truth, goodness, and beauty. They're not great at it. Moreover, they admit they're not great at it. And this is what's so great about them. This is um, in Caesar Augustus, one of his propagandists is Virgil's Aeneid. So Virgil writes the Aeneid and he has these famous lines where the son, uh, where Anchises, says to in, uh, Aeneas in the underworld, he says this, this is a uh, book six, book six lines 1010 and following. And Kisses is talking about the Romans. And he says this, these are, so these are pagans talking. This is around the year one, you know, uh, first century BC. Others will no doubt, he's talking about the Greeks. Others will hammer out bronze that breathes more softly and draw living faces out of stone. They will plead cases better and chart the rising of every star in the sky. So he's acknowledging that Greeks are so great. They've got all these great things. We're going to adopt all their gods. We're going to change Zeus into Zupert. We're going to change all their gods into ours. We're going to take their drama. We're going to take everything good about them. But he says, your mission, Roman, is to rule the world. These will be your arts, to establish peace, to spare the humbled, and to conquer the proud. So the Roman mind is a mind of administration. And that's why Roman law is still influencing us today. In Roman law and administration is what has a really created the modern world. Roman law. And that's why when the Greek, when the Greeks lose the Latin language, they lose the Roman mind of administration, the Roman mind of unity. And the greatness of the Roman Empire was in accepting the greatness of other cultures, as, as you saw right here with Greece. They accept the greatness of the Greece as the Greeks and they let the Greeks be Greeks and they adopt their greatness into the administration of the Roman empire. And you see, so this is the Latin mind and God used the Latin mind to create the Christian church. And you see, you already see this, you already see the parallels with the, with the, you know, the Greek, and we'll get into this in just a minute, but the Greek mind 
is just not one of administrative unity. It's one of philosophy. And so we get into the Pontifex Maximus. So this is the office of the Roman emperor, which is created by Caesar Augustus in the first century BC, which is just another iteration of this priest king. It's the same thing. But what he does is he goes, he takes the king of kings. He wants the king of kings, just like Alexander. So all the Roman empires are, all the old Roman emperors are going to try to get the king of kings title again, like Alexander and Emperor Heraclius right before the Muhammad conquest will do just that. And we'll get to that in just a minute. So, but there's this thirst to exalt in the empire, in this earthly city. And so he creates the office of Pontifex Maximus. Pontifex Maximus means high priest. It means he is the high priest. He is the one who presides over the Roman religion. And the Roman religion is just a pantheon of all gods. We're just going to adopt every new god we conquer. We're just going to adopt them into the pantheon. And that is the picture of the greatness because they are accepting the greatness of every culture, but they are uh, in, in the pantheon of the Pontifex Maximus, just a, you know, a polytheism, obviously, of demons. So these are all demons, demon gods. Now, what happens is he ups the ante with the right of triumph. He takes the right of triumph from Alexander and he creates the triumph arch which is where he's literally cementing the, this culture, this, this right, this religious right, which is worshiping the, the priest king. And he creates a monument called the Triumph Arch. And this is something maybe uh, you or Michael, your viewers have seen the Arch of Trajan. That's the famous uh, engraving of, of the conquering of Jerusalem where they're holding the menorah. And they're holding the menorah in the, the Triumph Arch. And what the Triumph Arch is, it is a monument commemorating the right of triumph. So we came to this city and we did this huge parade and we paraded all our enemies in front of you and we killed them. And it was this great parade. And now we're going to build this awesome arch where you're going to remember how awesome it was and how great we are and how God, we are the sons of God and we bring logos to the world. So this is the Roman religion at the time of Christ. Now, St. Paul uses, he adopts, St. Paul and the other authors adopt this language when they speak of Christ. So not only king of kings and not only son of God, which also has other Jewish aspects as well with Philo, but we can't get into that. But they also, there's, there's two instances in the New Testament where St. Paul actually uses the term triumph. He says in one place, he says that uh, God leads us in triumph and he also, Christ also triumphs over the principalities and powers, leading them in open show. So he's taking the Roman religion and he's using this as a theological picture because everybody knew what a triumph was. If you've been anywhere in the Roman Empire, everybody wishes that they could have been there, but at least they can look at the triumph arch. So this is the situation. So basically what we have is we have a pagan society that's worshiping demons, but we have an extremely ingrained pagan priesthood, which is in the person of the emperor at the time of the conversion of Constantine. And Constantine himself erects the greatest Roman triumph arch in the city of Rome. And he has erected statues of himself uh, as the new Jupiter. And so the pagan religion, so it, it's very much still alive and you have this vestige of the religion continuing after the Constantinian period. And this is what needs to inform our discussions when we talk about the tensions between East and West. So we did all this, we're talking about all these things, spent 25 minutes trying to get all this basics in line so that we can actually talk about the distinction between we talk about Greek East and Latin West. I'm going to insert that that's too simplistic. We also talk about conciliarity versus primacy. I'm going to assert that that's too simplistic. We also talk about the ecumenical patriarch versus the Petrian primacy. That's also too simplistic because the real dichotomy on a very cultural level, on the visceral level of the common man, the common person on the street who's disputing about the homoousios is the cultural momentum of this pagan religion 
And the dichotomy, the, the strong tension is between the Pontifex Maximus, sacred emperor on the one hand, and all of his bishops that he appoints on the one hand, and his see that he has elevated on the one hand because of his sacred office, because the elevation of Constantinople as the as the see because of the, he's an imperial city, it makes perfect sense. If the if the emperor is the Pontifex Maximus, it makes perfect sense. His bishop needs to be higher in the ecclesiastical hierarchy. It makes perfect sense with the Pontifex Maximus ideology. All of that whole religious momentum and instinct of the pagan converted con pagan uh, Romans, that against the Petrine office of Pope and every other bishop, not just the Roman see, but every single other bishop as well, because every single bishop has the Petrine office. There's a Petrine primacy of every single bishop. There's, there's every single diocese has a Petrine office. And you also have the Petrine office of the Roman see. But what you see with the sacred emperor, the Pontifex Maximus, the Roman emperor from Constantine on, they do not respect the Petrine office, not only of the Pope, but any other bishop either. And that's, they're acting as the Pontifex Maximus. And that's what you see as time goes on. So what you see in the history of this split is, is you see this priest-king office continuing to exert its will on the church and acting like the Pontifex Maximus, like, like the Pontifex Maximus would normally act. And Constantine does it right off the bat. You have, he's doing it in the Donatist controversy in the West. Now with Nicaea, he calls Nicaea, the church accepts the Roman model of this imperial administrative council, which we can, we can trace back to Jerusalem council, but there's a, an adoption of a great deal of Roman uh, cultural elements like the Roman Senate administration issuing canons, issuing law, you know, canon law is based on this Roman model. Now, what's interesting, here's a, um, I'm going to read this quote from Constantine. Constantine not only is acting as Pontifex Maximus, he issues decrees concerning dogma. So he said, he writes to Athanasius, Contra Arians, uh, 11, uh, 59. He says this. So Constantine to Athanasius, because now you know my will regarding dogma. So this is after the Nicene Council. Grant an unobstructed entrance to all who wish to enter the church. If I were to become aware that you, Athanasius, hindered some of being from being united to the church or forbade their entrance, then I will send immediately an official who by my command will depose you and transfer you to another location. That's the attitude of Constantine as Pontifex Maximus to the greatest bishop of the era, St. Athanasius. And this is the attitude and this is the instinct of the sacred emperor, the Pontifex Maximus, through the whole history of the Greek West schism. And this is what is, it's essentially, this is basically a sacramental theology question. Does the, say, the Roman emperor have a priesthood? It's a theological question which has a massive impact on culture and society because when the when any culture is um, converted, the Michael, if you could put this this graphic online, so this is the baptism of a culture. So logos incarnate is revealed, and then the Christian culture baptizes the existing people. So it first really happens in the, um, the, the big example is the, um, the Armenians. So they, they convert in 301 and St. Gregory, the illuminator goes through and he destroys all the demonic cults, which are the thrones of the demons. And then he builds the oldest cathedral in the world in Armenia. And this is what happens in every single people, every single Christian culture. And whether we're talking about by the way, we're talking about Syrians, Syriac, Nestorian Christians, so-called. They go all the way to the east. They're breaking, they're destroying, they're doing the same thing in modern Iran. They're doing the same thing as St. Patrick's doing over in Ireland. They're doing the same thing as St. Fulmentius is doing, in, or Fulgentius is doing in uh, Ethiopia. This is, the, this is the instinct of every Christian bishop is to baptize the people. So we're taking the cultists and the culture that's been passed down in this people since Adam, and we're going to cleanse the demonic content from it. 
and we're going to keep what has been passed down in the logos from Adam. We're going to keep their language, some of their customs, you know, their cuisine, their dance and things of that nature, and especially their language, which forms their mind and their philosophy. But we're going to inform their culture with the Christian culture, with the right of the mass. And so this is the struggle that needs to inform the discussion of the Greek West schism in the period of the seven ecumenical councils, because what's happening is we have two different types of priest emperors. We have the Roman emperor who's a, who's a Roboam like Constantine or Theodosius or Justinian. They're Roboam. They, they're completely orthodox. There's nothing unorthodox about their doctrine, but especially with Justinian, you see the imposition of the Pontifex Maximus. There is Justinian issues edicts. He issues dogmatic edicts. That was the beginning of the Fifth Ecumenical Council. He, he starts a, a dogmatic edict in the very beginning of the whole problem. He starts it by issuing a dogmatic edict. Well, that's an act of the Pontifex Maximus. And this, so there's the Roboam. So there's, they're Orthodox, but they're still acting as Pontifex Maximus. And then you have the Jeroboam, obviously, who are all the heretical emperors. And they're just inventing their new heresy and they're imposing that on the on the Christian people. And so it's just a, a different form of Pontifex Maximus. And what you have in the famous uh, the famous two swords doctrine. So this is a crucial period. Now, and before I mention that though, so what's happening is they are creating these, these, they're either creating the um, the heresies or they're imposing their will so that the society does not need to convert in morals. So the, the morals of the people can still be pagan. We still want to uh, have this great brutality. We need, still want to have this brutal slave trade. We still want to have these pagos morals. We, we, as the, the imperial court, we still want to have our mistresses. We still want to have our adultery. We don't want to convert to Christian morals. We'd like Christ to be an Arian Christ, where he can just be one of the pantheon, and I can still be the sacred emperor and do what I want. And that's really the heart of this controversy. It's not an abstraction in just, we're all just having a theological dialogue for seven centuries. The theology has a massive impact on society in the way that people want to live. They don't want to convert. This is what happens in every people. There's a resistance. And the resistance is led by the priest emperor, the priest king. He does not want to change his morals. He doesn't want to give up control of the world of society to the church. He wants to retain control. So trying to wrap up so I can <laughs> stop talking here, but there's so much more to say. But what you see with Justinian is you see the loss of the Latin language. And he issues the Justinian Code in Latin, but then the novelle are issued in Greek. So that point, at that point, the Roman Empire has lost the Roman language. And with it, the Roman mind of administration, and especially, most importantly, what we read from Virgil, that acceptance of the greatness of other cultures and incorporating them into an administrative body. So what you see here, and we, we've I've completely passed over the Syriac Christians. I really want to talk about them. But uh, what's interesting about the Syriac, so the Syriac Christians are, some say, the dominant church all the way up to 1300, and it's completely ignored by most historians. Um, they stretch all the way to Japan and they have a massive uh, missionary work going east. Um, and it's uh, such a big story. And there's so, so few secondary sources even going into it because there's a huge stack of Syriac manuscripts, I'm told, sitting in the Vatican that no one's translated. So there's so much more work to do and there's so few scholarly sources. But what seems to be the case from sympathetic sources that I looked at is that the Syriac Christians are also dealing with the same priest king figure, so the Persian king, he's the king of kings. He's this Zoroastrian, which is um, actually a more civilized religion than the Greco-Roman pantheon because it's it's somewhat more monotheist. Um, but it's still the same the same thing, priest king trying to dominate the church. But what's interesting is you see one of the marks of the true Christian culture is the crusade, and. Let me define what I mean by crusade. Crusade is the use of the temporal sword to defend the spiritual sword. And you actually see this with the Rome, the pious Roman empress. You see this actually with a pious empress, St. Pulcheria. She launches a 
war with Persia to defend the Persian Christians. This is in the 400s. She's the one who helps instigate Council of Ephesus and Chalcedon. She, in, she institutes, this is a war to defend Christ. It's a, def it's a war of defense for Christ and for the name of Christ and for Christians. It's entirely devoted to Christian ideals and, and ends. It has nothing to do with trying to expand the Roman emperor, empire. And this is the, the crusading element. Now, before I mentioned uh, Justinian's non-crusade, so you have the doctrine of the two swords. So uh, Pope St. Gelatius rebukes the Emperor Zeno, so the Achaean Schism. Um, I'm sure your viewers are familiar with the Achaean Schism. <laughs> uh, but basically, it's the Pontifex Maximus imposing, once again, his, his heretical formula to try to figure out unity with all the Greek parties that are, are dividing against each other since Chalcedon since Ephesus. And um, Pope Gelasius says, first of all, he says that the demons invented the Pontifex Maximus. Now, the term Pontifex is, the title Pontifex is still used by the Christian Roman emperors into the 6th century. And even into the 10th century, there are still rites on the books in the Roman Empire in, Constant, in, the, Constant, uh, in the Greek Roman Empire in the East, Constantinople, which venerate the priesthood of the emperor. So there's still this priesthood element strongly, tenaciously holding on to and, and refusing to convert to the priesthood of Jesus Christ. And Gelasius says that the demons invented the Pontifex Maximus, and he illustrates the what the East calls symphonia by talking about two different swords. The, the temporal sword, which is the emperor, the kings who defend the natural order, defend the borders. And then there's the spiritual sword, which is accountable for the salvation of souls. And he says that the priesthood of the spiritual sword is the higher because it must make account for the souls of emperors. So it must guide and convert society. And it must inform the conversion of Christian peoples. So, the but what you see with with Justinian. So Justinian takes the throne and he restores the Pontifex Maximus, and he launches his own crusade. But it's a crusade for the earthly city. It's a reconquest of the Roman borders. He so he reconquests Africa. He reconquests Italy. He even allows his general Belisarius to do a Christianized rite of triumph. And he erects the Hagia Sophia as a Christianized triumph arch. So it's a church, but it is his masterwork, and it's remembered in Greek memory as sort of a triumph arch, even though it's church. And so Justinian is this quintessential figure of the Pontifex Maximus because he is perfectly orthodox, except at the end of his life, he starts promoting a heresy. But he is perfectly orthodox, but he is still exerting his Pontifex Maximus on the church. And most of all, he is, he is instigating a crusade for the earthly city. So what is tragic is that the Persian Syriac Christians were never, were very much viewed as political enemies. So the, the crusade of Pulcheria, which sought to defend Persian Christians was overshadowed by Justinian's crusade for the earthly city. The Syriac Christians, meanwhile, were somewhat forced to a degree to compromise and allow this pagan king of kings to appoint their own pope. So the Catholicos of Seleucia Ctesiphon, that was the capital of the Persian Empire, was appointed since 410, uh, was, a, was, was appointed by the king of kings, the, the pa pagan king. Moreover, the Syriac Christians, because the Zoroastrian religion in the Persian Empire it basically hated celibacy. That was one of the most offensive things because it, marriage and children was a, a strong obligation to the Zoroastrians. And the Syriac Christians actually abolished celibacy. So all of their bishops were married. And that's from 486. And so monasticism dies in the Syriac Christians. So there's a, there's a very strong effort to conform with the society of the Persian Empire. And there's a strong effort among some of the Syriacs to uh, get greater power with the Persian king of kings. 
but there's still this great element of uh, not only piety, but there is an orthodoxy because we didn't even have time to go into all the different Christological controversy, but essentially what we can see with, with scholarship as it is today, that there was at least a mixture of partisans of mere terminology on the one hand, in the, all these Christological controversies, you have the Chalcedonians, you have the Miaphysites or Monophysites, you have the Nestorians or Syriac or Assyrians, whatever you want to call them, basically these three parties. And in these different parties, there were those who were merely partisans of terminology, but they were orthodox. They were simply asserting that, no, this is just the terminology we should use, even though I understand it the same way as you. And there were also heretics. There were heretics promoting pure heresy and instigating bloody mobs. So you have to sit down and die, uh, do you do a theologos is what that is. A theologos is what uh, what people falsely call a dialogue today. Dialogue today is a, a dirty word because it's so misused. A theologos is what the Greeks did with Socrates, what Plato did. Plato wrote about a theologos is when two parties speak and they penetrate the truth. This is what reason and theology does is a theologos. When people penetrate the truth, they, they we, we try to penetrate what is the truth. And we're trying to seek out the truth. We're not trying to just sing kumbaya and be happy about our differences. And this is what Athanasius actually does. So way back when we quoted Constantine, Constantine just wanted to impose his Pontifex Maximus will on the church and depose Athanasius. But Athanasius, the turning point in the, in the Arian controversy is when Athanasius, 362, Council of Alexandria. Julian the Apostate gives everybody freedom because he thinks the Christians are just going to kill each other and he's going to laugh at it. Well, Alexandria calls the council, Athanasius brings them together and they says, okay, let's discuss why are you not accepting the homoousios? What do you mean by that? And they actually, some of them actually say, well, we actually are concerned about this heresy. We also believe in the dogma of the homoousios. We just disagree on the terminology. And this, this true theologos is what Athanasius did to win over the so-called orthodox semi-Arians. And this is the turning point. This is what really brings about the end of the crisis because he's winning over all these other parties who were against the homoousios until then. So this is what even John Meyendorf in Imperial Unity, he admits that this is really what was needed to resolve the Christological controversies with the monophysites. Justinian actually starts it. He says, okay, let's get together and let's actually debate this and figure it out. But soon when that fails, he says, okay, we're just going back to Pontifex Maximus. Here's a decree obey or I send my army. And that's what he does. And, and that is actually the story of the Greek West Schism, is the Pontifex Maximus asserting his edict on the church and saying, obey or I send my army. Now, finally, the uh, I'm going to wrap up here just a minute. Um, finally, God punishes the church with the invasion of the Mohammedans. Now, both every side of the Greek schism in the East, all the Greek schisms, they all saw it as God's punishment. But what they did was they blamed it on each other. And they said, well, it's, it's because of the Chalcedonians that us monophysites have been liberated from the Chalcedonians. And the Chalcedonians said, well, no, it's because of the monophysite heresy that the Mohammedans came in. But the pious among them. So I'm going to read. Um, let me read this quote here. And then I'm going to talk about Charlemagne and I'll be all done. <laughs> um, so. Here's uh, a quote from, okay, so this is from Yohanan Bar Ben Kaye. He's uh, an Assyrian, a Syriac Christian, um, writing in Persia, or at that time, the Mohammedans. He says this, these people came, meaning the Mohammedans, these people came at God's command and took over, as it were, both kingdoms, meaning the Roman Empire and the Persian Empire. They were at war all this time. God having called them from the ends of the earth so as to destroy them, a sinful nation, Roman Empire, and to bring low through them the proud spirit of the Persians. So that's the pious opinion of a Syriac Christian. Now, here's one of our own saints, St. Saint Sophronius. He says this, the godless Saracens entered the holy city of Christ our Lord Jerusalem with the permission of God and in punishment for our negligence, which is considerable. We are ourselves, in truth, responsible for all these things, and no word will be found for our defense. So the epic moment 
right before the Mohammedans invade is when Heraclius launches the second, what we might call Byzantine, Byzantine crusade. So we had Bulgaria before, but then we have Heraclius who launches his, his crusade, which is where he launches his army with, with the banner of Jesus Christ on all of the, uh, the banner of his army has Jesus Christ and the Theotokos. They launch a crusade to recover the true cross. Um, many Eastern Orthodox will know the story. This is the return of the, of the Holy Cross to Jerusalem. And God works a miracle to humble Heraclius because Heraclius was just another Pontifex Maximus. He was in an incestuous marriage with his niece that he forced the patriarch to approve, but he was shocked into action by the Persian invasion and he launched a crusade and God gave him the victory because he fought in the name of Jesus and not in the name of Rome. And this was really the moment where all of the Eastern Christians could repent. They could all be humbled under the power of the cross, not only the Greek Chalcedonians and not only the Monophysites, but also the Syriac Christians. Because at that time, mon monasticism had been revived. You had Babai the Great, who was codifying Syriac Christology and trying to create the distinction between hypostases and prosopon and the Syriac kanomi. So you have this opportunity right now, but what happens? Heraclius turns into another Pontifex Maximus. He adopts the title King of Kings, like Alexander the Great had done, and the Mohammedans finally invade. And then he promotes the monothelite and monoenergism, uh, the heresy. So he's just another Pontifex Maximus. God punishes the East with Mohammedan heresy. And finally, there is a military advantage in the West, which finally beats back the army of the Pontifex Maximus. The Pontifex Maximus continually pushing for the imposition of his doctrine. Well, during all this time, when Justinian is losing the Latin language and they are becoming increasingly provincial, so they're condemning not only the Latin filioque, but by implication, the Syriac filioque. There is, in fact, a Syriac filioque that goes back to the 5th and 6th century. But they're also condemning their other political rivals, the Armenians. Here's a quote from a Greek rubric which curses the Armenians. Armenia was a kingdom, like as we said, who converted way back in 3301, but that was the kingdom that the Persian Empire and the Roman Empire were kind of like, they're continually fighting over the Armenian kingdom. So there's yet another political rival. And the Greek rubric for Zacchaeus Sunday, uh, let me get this right. It's the rubric on Zacchaeus Sunday. This is quoting uh, Niles Calendarium Utrusque Ecclesiae, chapter two, eight. This is cited in Doss in the Making of Europe, note five, page 254. The rubric in the Greek book says this, quote, the thrice accursed Armenians practice a blasphemous fast on this day, but we eat cheese and eggs to refute their heresy. So that's the Greek mind towards the Armenians. And it's the same for the Syriacs and it's the same for the Latins because by losing the Latin language, they've lost the Latin mind to accept and incorporate the greatness of other cultures. But meanwhile, the West has been incorporating, this is the period of the so-called Byzantine papacy, and this is when in Rome, the city of Rome, there's incorporated not only Latins, not only Greeks, but also Syriacs. So during this period, there are various Latin popes, Greek popes, and Syrian popes. And this is really the context for, for the uh, Carolingian Renaissance, for Charlemagne being emperor of the Romans of the West, because it's accepting and integrating another culture. We also have the Visigoths and the English at this time. But... By that time, the Pontifex Maximus ideology had become so ingrained that, especially after Photius, you see this continual imposition of the Greek mind only and the Greek custom only, and a loss of the Roman mind, the Greco-Roman mind. The Greek, the East, never recovers the Roman language until the 17th century in Russia. They lose the Roman language, but they continually assert that they are the Roman Empire. Here's a quote from, I'll, I'll end with this. Um, this is 
this is from a hostile source, but it is quoted by, um, here's a history that I've used a lot is um, History of the Christian Church of the 1054 by um, Mikhail Poznov. He was a Russian converted to Catholicism in the 20th century. Um, so he, in the Balkan controversy, when the Greeks take over the Balkan territories during iconoclasm, there's always this dispute, as you're well aware, over the Balkans. And the Pope, papal legates, seek to return that uh, to the Latin jurisdiction as it was stolen from them by heretics. And the response, so at, this is after in the Photian schism and the Photium schism is healed. So they're healing the schism of the Photian, uh, Photium debate. So they heal the schism, but then they say, okay, now return the Balkan territory. And the Greeks respond, quote, it is completely inappropriate that you Romans who have rejected the Greek empire and united yourself in union with the Franks should preserve any right of jurisdiction in our empire. So you see in this quote, a, a complete amalgamation of the Greek mind of the Pontifex Maximus, the earthly empire with the kingdom of God. Now, in all fairness, we've basically, I've basically criticized two Eastern Christian groups, Syriacs and the Greeks. But I want to also emphasize that the West also had this problem, but they were dealing with so many Aryan barbarians and invasions that they couldn't start creating this problem until Charlemagne. Charlemagne starts creating the same problem with the priest king and in, in, they had in the East, same problem starts. But in the West, what's different is that you have the investiture controversy, which where the church asserts her rights in this true cultural model to convert society. So that is a long-winded way of trying to summarize um, these cultural factors. Um, so thank you for giving me this long monologue. I hope I haven't uh, bored everyone to this, death here. This was fun. And you, uh, I have a couple questions that I want to get uh, Eric and his, his comments and questions. Um, Two, two questions, actually. Uh, the first is you mentioned there the Edict um, of Justinian. And I believe, I'm pretty sure, it was accepted by the Fifth Ecumenical Council, incorporated into its acts, if I recall. Yes, to my correctly. knowledge, yes. Yeah, so is this an example maybe of the church embracing the Pontifex, uh, Pontifex Maximus view, as you put it? Um. That is, that is really the question, because the question is the relationship between the uh, temporal, temporal authority and the spiritual authority. Because the temporal authority, even in the West, does make actions of a doctrinal character in some sense. Because you have, right after this period, you have the pornocracy in the West, which is where Emperor Otto of the West, the Western Roman Emperor, comes and basically deposes the Pope, as Justinian had done. He had deposed the Pope himself, too. And so he deposes the Pope and this. So there is sort of a role for the lay authority in asserting its rights uh, or asserting some sort of influence on the church, which can be even violent. But um, you never really see a precedent and really until uh, really until the, the 1300s for really a strong doctrinal promotion of emperors, as you see with Justinian. Um, but with the Fifth Ecumenical Council, it's really the, uh, as Eric recently wrote, uh, it's really the best argument that the East has to try to promote uh, conciliarity and their arguments against the papacy. Sure. Um, and so that, so th this is a perfect question. Um, but essentially, the Fifth Ecumenical Council, as as uh, Eric himself has argued, is a great, is the best example of. Uh, concessions being made for the peace of, of the people of God. Uh, because if the, if even if the Pontifex Maximus, I mean, that's what the church did with Nicaea, Nicaea one. I mean, Constantine is very much uh, functioning as a pagan Pontifex Maximus and the church mm -hmm. accepts it and sees the benefit of it, yeah. accepts the benefit given to the church, you know, and building churches and promoting the church. And we accept the good, uh, but the church never accepted Constantine just, throwing his weight around no more than they accepted Constantius or Valens. And so, but what you see with Justinian is, you, especially the Fifth Ecumenical Council, you have all these imperial bureaucrats who are called bishops. These are imperial bureaucrats who are called bishops because they're all appointed by, they're appointed by Justinian 
and all these bishops are supporting him. Now, really what you see with, this is a great point you've made, Michael, recently about Vatican II. What you see in, in most every ecumenical council is God bringing good out of evil. I mean, you have great, you have, you have Saint, Saint Cyril is the great example at Ephesus. You know, he's, he's terrorizing the city of Ephesus with an army of monks. And uh, God brings good out of evil, even though we don't we don't suggest that the church should come around and, and make an army of monks. So um, in answer to your question, I, I would view that as a concession because the edict was accepted to be orthodox. Now, the Fifth Ecumenical Council has other issues, especially regarding the Syriacs, of course, because it condemns the Syriacs, the main Syriac father, Theodore Mopsiestia, post-mortem, which was the big controversy before we even talked about the um, Christology. So there's issues, uh, but essentially the Fifth Ecumenical Council is condemning uh, the Syriac tradition if it is understand understood in a Nestorian way. So it's condemning those things in those in those ways, and it's conceding to the good that is trying to come out of a, a chaotic, violent situation with a lot of bloodshed for the mm -hmm. peace of the church. One other question. You had briefly mentioned there the Syriac filioque. I know there are probably a lot of people watching right now asking, what is the Syriac filioque and what's your basis for that? Could you briefly tell us about that? Because I know a lot of people are going to be. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that. like I said, so first of all, with we're dealing with the Syriac tradition, we just need to accept that there just has not been enough scholarship to even understand 50% maybe even of the Syriac tradition. We just, there's literally not enough scholars who know Syriac and publish stuff about Syriac to even understand the whole Syriac tradition. Uh, the, there's the Patrologia, the, the PG and the PL, and then there's the, I think it's the PO, uh, if I recall. And it's, that's all the other Eastern fathers. So not only Syriac, but Ethiopian, Armenian, and that's still being published to this day. So they're still coming out. They're still codifying these manuscripts. So having said that, um, the Syriac filioque, there's two recensions of, so what happens in the, in the council of Seleucia Ctesiphon in 410? In 410, so the, the period of the Aryan crisis in Persia is a period of massive persecution of Christians in Persia. So they're just being martyred and killed left and right. And they finally come to a point where they can even lift up their heads for a second and find out what's going on outside of Persia. And that's what happens in 410. They have a, a council of Seleucia Ctesiphon. There's a Roman bishop who comes over to Seleucia Ctesiphon and says, hey, we had this council of Nicaea while you were struggling against you know, we were struggling against heresy. We were struggling against Aaronism and his army. You were struggling against pagans and your army. Here's this Greek creed that we made to deal with our Aryan heresy. And here's all these Greek canons that we came out with. Now, we encourage you to do the same to organize your church. So it's a great sort of charitable uh, interaction. Now, I want to recommend for people who are interested, this is the best scholarly work that I found, which is... Um, the Church of the East, A Concise History by Baum and Winkler. There's also a sy sympathetic uh, apologetic work by uh, Mar Bawai Soro. He's a Chaldean bishop. Um, if you want to learn more, there's also Philip Jenkins, Lost History of Christianity, uh, another great work. But just scratching the surface on this huge tradition that's totally ignored by the history. Um so, but getting to your question, the Syriac filioque is a recension. So when we say recension, it's just a copying of all the manuscripts down through the line. We finally found one dating to the 6th century, which is a copy of a copy of a copy that goes back to this council in 410. So out of 410, there's two different recensions in Syriac. Okay. So there's a Syriac Nicene call. So they take the Nicene uh, Creed in Greek. They translate it into Syriac. They take the Greek canons, and here's a, a very important point for the Greek West Schism. They take the Greek canons of Nicaea, and then they translate those to Syriac, and then they change a bunch of them for their own context. And they say, well, we don't need that canon here because that's not even applicable to us, so we make this other canon. And that's exactly the same thing that happened in the West. So you have the same thing happening in the Syriacs and in the Latins, where they conform the Greek Council of Nicaea to their existing apostolic tradition, they translate it, and then they translate their own canons, what they've been passed down for their own fathers. So the, the Eastern Orthodox apologetic against Rome, they have the same problem against the Syriacs, but there's so few Syriacs to make their own argument 
that they can just ignore the Syriacs. But it's still on on their their argument. They have to also say the Syriacs are heretics, kind of from day one, from from 410, basically, even before any of this problem was coming about. So this Syriac filioque is these two different recensions of the Syriac creed from 410. One of them includes a filioque phrase, and one of them does not. So if someone's going to assert that the filioque is, is heresy, um, they're going to have to assert that either one, the, a bunch of Latins came all the way to the Persian Empire and also taught them the heresy, which is just absurd. Uh, that's like what the Mohammedans accuse us of. They say we changed the scriptures in the beginning, and then we, we brought that everywhere and told everybody the heresy. That's just absurd. Or they have to admit that there is an apostolic filioque that was passed down that also shows up in the Syriacs. And so there are these two, there's, we can't get into all the East, there's the East Syriac and the West Syriac. Um, I believe it's the West Syriac that actually has the filioque, if, if memory serves, but um, there's a sense, so there's basically it's a, a the Syriac creed is, um, and we confess the living and Holy Spirit, the living paraclete who is from the Father and the Son. So that's the translation of S.P. Brock from the Syriac. So it's saying the Holy Spirit is from the Father and the Son. So that's the that's the filioque phrase in Syriac translated into English. We need to get Brock back on the show and ask him about that. I think that'd be fun. Um, <clears throat> Eric, let me pass it over to you. Comments and questions. Yeah, thank you, Michael. Um, Timothy, uh, is my audio coming in? Yep. All right, good. Thank you so much for that. I know that uh, when I met up with you in Michigan, we went on a small walk and we talked about this, but it's so so good to, and refreshing to hear the overview of this again, your uh, your book. Um, and I, I can't help but resonate with what you, your, you're saying here about these, you know, going back to this priest kingly figure because uh, one of my favorite books on the papacy and the church is by an Anglican named Trevor Jolland. And I, I've recommended that book before, but throughout the whole book, he's explaining over and over again how the Constantinian revolution um, really is to, he traces the East-West break um, from, from that. And he really, roots it in the example of how the Eusebian bishops were at odds with Pope Julius and uh, the Roman See intervening in those synods with, with regard to St. Athanasius. And of course, they depended largely on the imperial chancery, as you know. And, you know, you, this keeps going as a thread. Uh, like you said, it really hypes up in Justinian, it continues again under Heraclius, Heraclius and then um, obviously the Asarian emperors, iconoclastic emperors, those were not fun. Um, so I, I really do think that, you know, one of the criticisms that Eastern Orthodox have given in the, in the past about this though, is that the West can't uh, accuse the Byzantine East of Caesaro papism because the popes of Rome also um, subscribed to this idea, not just an idea, and it wasn't just a, a practical utility, they actually justified it on theological terms for the king being endowed by God with authority in the realm as a sort of Basileus Sacerdos figure who had the right to convene councils, had the right to intervene on certain things about the church. Obviously, it, it seems as though it was a razor edge balance because Galatius saw the East just taking it out of proportion. And so your reference to the two swords theory is, is, is emphatic. Um, but what would you say, you know, if, one of the Eastern Orthodox listeners are listening to this and, you know, they happen to be reading Father McGuckin who, you know, uh, and some of the modern historians who, who say, you know, the West can't um, point fingers when it comes to Caesaro papist abuse. Yeah. I bet this is the best objection to what I'm saying. And my answer is 
Well, then call a council and assert a church ecclesiastical organ that transcends nations, that is uh, able to overcome Caesar or Papism. We both have the problem. I admit it. It's it's different in the West, and it's different because of just his. I mean, one, I I view the Latin mind as a big factor. Uh, the fall of Rome happens in 410, and Augustine writes the city of God. It's really not any treatise, to my knowledge, uh, until you really get into, especially the possessors and non-possessors controversy in Russia later on in the second millennium, where there's this very strong theological argument for the city of God over the city of man. There, so we we can point to different historical factors, and without any, you know, polemical intent, we can simply just say, well, the West was dealing with barbarian invasions and, and heresy for eight hundred years. That's why they didn't have Caesar or Papism. It's not because they were so great. So, what happens with Charlemagne? Charlemagne is first of all the coronation ceremony, the foundation of the Western polity, is founded on the bishop anointing the king. This is not in the Eastern ceremony. The Eastern ceremony does not pick this up until the 13th century. Um, and so by anointing the king in this coronation ceremony, there is a, uh, a cultic, a, a ritual acknowledgement that the church must dictate the morals of the culture. Now, this was happening in the East. It was happening in the East. Uh, you have by w the year 1000, you have the gradual abolition of the slave trade. That's one of the biggest marks you can see for the conversion of society is the abolition of the slave trade. The slave trade is, in fact, condemned by the New Testament in First Timothy and Revelation. People don't realize that because there's a, an acceptance of domestic slavery. But slave trading is using violence and killing people to capture families. That's a lot different than just being converted into a slave. So the conversion happens in the East, but you don't have any sort of movement to the social impact that you have with the Cluniac reform in the 1000s, 1100s, 1200s. You have the investiture controversy. You don't have a parallel of that in the East. The investiture controversy is when a bunch of monks asserted that the lay authority does not have authority to dictate to the church who can be bishop. Uh, oh, absolutely, that is. Uh, and the church is responsible for converting society. And they asserted it so forcibly, forcibly that that's really what created the Middle Ages, created the, the crusade. Um, and this is not something that's paralleled in the East, This the penetration of society so greatly with the gospel. And that's because of this investor controversy. Um, the investor controversy does not exist in the East in the same way. There is an arresting of the influence of the church on pagan morals. And a, a good example, just a, a different mark is how many, how many czars and how many Roman emperors were saints? Well, there's very few. And even the ones that are saints are um, kind of got in by the skin of their teeth, saints like Saint Justinian or Saint <laughs> Constantine the Great. You know, Saint Constantine the Great is a saint, only has a local. He's not in the Roman Martyrology, but there are so many Western kings who are saints and martyrs, and that's not because they're great, not because the West is better. It's what I'm saying is there's different historical factors that led to a deeper penetration, which was able to overcome the Caesar of papism, which was there. And it was able to overcome it to such a degree that they had to have the Protestant revolution to have Caesar of papism. They couldn't really get the Caesar of papism out of Catholicism. They had to invent an entire new, new religion to get it. Um, and now there's other factors. There's a lot of other factors, <laughs> but um, those are the initial thoughts I'd say, but it, it's, I mean, it's another show in and of itself, but uh, it's no, definitely I think the you're best absolutely critique. Right, yeah. Though. yeah, I think you're absolutely right because, you know, as soon as the church and the state uh, merged in that Constantinian revolution, um, <clears throat> it seems as though 
you know, there was it was difficult to have a homeostasis when when there was a right order to things. And it seems as though when both were willing to play ball on the terms that were appropriate for both sides, things were peaceful. But often things would 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 go off balance. And it, you don't really get something like the investiture controversy in the East. And so the West, um, you have this opportunity you could say um for you know because it, it, before that it, it is a question of well who's higher in authority the emperor or the bishops or the pope and you know a lot of uh orthodox historians point to the byzantine captivity of the papacy in the you know uh sixth six to seven centuries and how you know this was tolerated even by the Roman bishops, uh, mainly because they didn't have a whole lot of freedom in the in the matter without getting involved with uh, some unwanted consequences, whether whether lack of military assistance or you know just having to fend off Western invaders without the help of the Byzantine army. A lot of these things uh, involved pressure. And so they call it a, a modus vivendi, where I think the Roman popes were sort of tolerating this Byzantine superiority. But as soon as the Western powers rose, um, cum petro et su petro, you know, with and under Peter, um, we start to see the emergence of the Western idea, where, you know, the, the state has its place under and with Peter. And so this is where you get this primary place of the Pope, even involved with world politics in medieval Europe. And, uh, you know, when you start to see, understand that, you under, you have start to have sympathy for the claims of guys like Pope St. Gregory VII or Pope Innocent III. You know, those are bad guys. Those are boogeymen for a lot of people when they don't understand the context of their time. And... I think it's very important to point this out because, you know, the West had the opportunity to show the sacred rights of the church had to be protected by her own hierarchy. And of course, the Pope is, is the, the chief in that regard. Uh, you had another comment? Well, I, had I just wanted to add question. one another point real quick. Another mark is that the central controversy is about the ecclesiastical order of Constantinople which is essentially an assertion by the East that the ecclesiastical polity of the church should be governed by the earthly city, should be governed by the Roman Empire. Well, that's Caesar of Papism. The, the assertion of Rome has always been Petrine primacy, even though they're in the R Roman imperial power. And you see this also in the East because there's all these iterations of a Roman Empire. You have not only the Greeks, but also the Russians, obviously, but the uh, Bulgarians, the, uh, the uh, Serbians also, they assert a Roman empire. Now you don't have to have that in the West. You have a Roman, Holy Roman emperor, but you have the King of France and he doesn't really try to be the Roman emperor per se. He's just, I'm French. I'm the French King. I'm the Spanish King. I'm the English King. They're not trying to create, recreate that Roman empire. Um, even though there is a sense of a sacred emperor in the West as well, but it's much more subdued. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Um, yeah, it's, uh, I had so many notes here. Um, I mean, we could talk all day about this, but um, you know, I really. Uh, how do you how do you see the Council of Florence um, in its decree on Pat uh, Petrine primacy as um, sort of a resolution to this? Because I know even at that council, we <laughs> from the get go we see the emperor and the pope sort of. Uh, locking horns on just procedure. <laughs> um, and it's interesting how, uh, you know, when when some of the Greek bishops wanted to discuss things, they had to get the okay of uh, Emperor uh, uh, John, John VIII, uh, John VIII, Belialogos, right? If I have that correct, yeah. Um, that shows where the climate developed by the 15th century in the east and that tapestry really continues even into uh 
the post orthodox ethos after the Ottomans take over uh, the the city of Constantinople as they moved upward north through the Balkans and eventually uh, settling in in Holy Rus and the Moscow Patriarchate and the whole church state alliance in that regard um, do you see this can, this whole theme continuing into the you know the great Russian church and the history of its own absolutely um, I, I this is, it, from my view, and this is what I say in my book. Basically, this this my book is attempting to show, attempting to assert that this very this very issue with the Pontifex Maximus in all of its iterations is the central aspect because the the world is always trying to resist the gospel. Every new king is trying to resist the gospel and resist further conversion to Christ, further conversion of the laws and customs of our societies. To Christ, and it's always trying to find a new way to get out of it. But what you see in the East, especially in Russia, you see just a greater and greater domination of the church by the Czar. Finally, the Czar abolishes the patriarchate. I mean, there's nothing like that in the West. Napoleon tries it, he fails. Uh, the Protestant revolt tries it, they fail. Even the imperialist, I mean, in, so in Florence, I mean, all these councils need to be, even Vatican I especially, needs to be understood by the East as dealing with Western controversies primarily. Even Florence, because the whole controversy in Florence is in the context of the conciliar controversy in the West. Um, but there's a, con so in the West, there's a continual back and forth and conflict over this very issue. In the East, it's just sort of, a, it's in, in Russia where they're free. They're free in Russia. Obviously, we're not going to, you know, put it against the Greeks under the Mohammedans. But under Russia, um, it is there is a continual further domination of the church by the czar, and this is at the root of the current schism between Constantinople and Moscow, because this was the root of the Russian Church in the Council of 1551. Uh, uh, what is it, Stanislav Sobor? I can't remember the Russian word for it, but the 1551, when their own saints said that there's a third Rome, that they're the new Rome, that's taught by their own Russian saints. That's in their own Russian tradition. And that's the problem because they've adopted the Pontifex Maximus into the Russian tradition. They transferred it over to them. And that's the source of the whole controversy that's generating this current schism, which is just another, yet another breaking out of schism or proxy schism that's been going on really since Florence, because Florence is really the origin of this dispute between Constantinople and Russia. Um, whereas after Florence and after Lateran V, especially Lateran V is really the council that condemns conciliarism. It's not Vatican I. Okay, Lateran V is the council. And then Trent, the papacy sort of restores itself as able to go on the counterattack and create second Christendom, the Christendom of the Americas, the Christendom of uh, the Baroque civilizations in Spain and Austria, Italy. Um, you see this continual back and forth in the West between this fight with Caesaropapism. It's a fight, a continual fight. Um, in the East, there's a very strong tradition of accepting the Roman Caesaropapism of Third Rome or Second Rome and the Sacred Emperor. Yeah, I think that... Um... I think that recounting all this history and how it unfolds, if people are, you know, predisposed against the idea of a Pope figure, you know, someone who has universal jurisdiction, I mean, admittedly, in, the, in our co contemporary culture, uh, people who are unfamiliar with church history and ecclesiology, just the whole idea of a papal primacy of authority and jurisdiction, it just sounds antithetical to the Christian faith. You know, which, you know, like Jesus said, um, it will not be like the Gentiles among you where they lord it over you. And so it's, it's very easy for people to, to try and show how the papacy is not a Christian institution. But if you go through all this history and you recount how, you know, especially with the the Byzantine Greek Church, and you know, eventually at the you know the Greco for Greco uh, Russian uh, I identity. Um, 
if there is going to be a figure who rises up in the midst of this with the power of unification that's rooted in the apostolic tradition and the church fathers, it can't be anything but the successor of St. Peter. And so, but that's the issue now is the Orthodox are searching for this subject that has a power of unification. You know, at the, at the Ravenna meeting, for example, they were all, they all at least came to the idea that there is a universal primacy, but they couldn't agree on what the basis for it was. They couldn't agree that it was necessarily something that Christ transacted to St. Peter. Um, and Russia responds even to that and says, look, there is no subject that has universal primacy uh, with anything above a moral or honorific status, uh, meaning just ceremonial respect and, you know, the head signatures on parchment and the first to preside at ecumenical meetings. But beyond that, there is no, you know, universal jurisdiction. So I think that recounting how uh, the Caesaro papist posture uh, really paralyzes the church from unifying is a testimony indirectly um, for the, the Latin um, tradition. Well, it's not a Latin tradition, right? It's the Catholic tradition of the uh, successor of Peter being endowed with a universal jurisdiction. What do you think? Yeah, and, and I would just emphasize again, the Petrine office is in every bishop. And that's also a factor because bishops too often in the East and the West have been just imperial bureaucrats appointed to fulfill the, the will of the ruler, whether he's a czar or the king of France. And so that's what, I mean, that's what universal jurisdiction of Vatican I is all about. It's trying to address the liberal revolutions which are asserting the liberal revolutions of the 19th century are asserting once again, the same old Roma Pontifex Maximus that the state cannot be dictated to by the church. They want to be a separation between church and state. And at that time, many of the bishops were still appointed as Imperial bureaucrats and Vatican one says, no, the Petrine office has universal jurisdiction over every bishop. They're not Imperial bureaucrats to be just the, the uh, office of the government. Um, and every single Petrine office in every single bishop has the authority to do what St. Ambrose did to Emperor Theodosius, which is, con which is preach the gospel, call him to repent, and tell President Biden to stay away from the Holy Sacrament because he's in mortal sin. But here we are in this problem. It's the same problem we've had in the beginning. So when can we expect your book to be published? Uh, God willing, it'll be this fall, published by Tan, um, Tan Books, and it'll be October, November, God willing. Um, and this is the backdrop that I give to the current debate between so-called trads and so-called conservatives. And I argue that this is really a, a breakdown of the fundamental aspects of Christian culture and the development of doctrine. And I, I try to assert that um, I, in my opinion, and I, I'm sure that you both agree with this, and this is why I love your show, that uh, it's far more complex than uh, the mainstream trad critique or even the mainstream conservative critique. There's a lot more complexity with the Vatican II controversy and the crisis in the church than we are led to believe by Twitter theologians. <laughs> Well, oh, thank, I, I really appreciate that, Timothy. Yeah, I was going to hand it over to you, uh, Michael, but I had I had a, a blast talking about this. The good old Twitter, Twitter theologians. Y'all sent some questions. I see a few already. Um, <clears throat> Inth Degree sends a super chat. He says, Prince Charles, when he ascends to the throne, can call for, could, could he call for an ecumenical council? His family is connected to the Eastern Orthodox what say ye, Timothy? Prince Charles. I, I am afraid I don't know enough about uh, current Europe, uh, English monarchy tradition. Uh, there's so many different customs and laws. Um, 
but that would be entirely up to the Eastern Orthodox. And I would predict that there would be a massive debate that would go on into infinity if that were to happen as to whether or not he could call it. Yeah. <laughs> but the Pope would say, no, he's a heretic. Yeah. Or he might not say that. He might actually ask for a blessing from him. I don't know. Maybe. But I can tell you Maybe. that I, Pope Innocent III. <laughs> I think the latter would probably be probably the latter. But we know which one was correct. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we know which one is right. But I, I think yeah. the latter is the more likely one. Um, again, y'all send some chat questions. Make sure to put it to at Reason in Theology. Um, I saw some a while back in the chat, but they they've moved on me since then. Uh, but they, sh they should be rolling in here any moment. But uh, a couple of people were asking, what was the name of the book? Can you just tell us just a little bit more yeah. about it specifically? Yep. Uh, so the current title right now that um, Tan and I have, we're, we haven't totally put the, put the ink to the presses yet, so this might mm -hmm. change slightly, but the current title is Uniting Conservatives and Traditionalists, mm -hmm. colon, the spiritual history of Catholic culture. So it's trying to synthesize the two individuals that I view as the greatest Catholic historians as a means to give greater context and depth to the, the resolving the crisis of the church today. Because in my view, uh, a great deal of the controversy has to do with false history, false simplified, oversimplified history, which is just sort of used as ideology uh, to try to, and this is what we get with, in these debates and it happens on both sides roman historians do the same thing as the greeks we do that we do it on both sides just oversimplifying history uh and avoiding the complexities and the complexities help us to inform a little bit more nuanced discussion and debate to try to get past uh both the new springtime optimism on the one hand and the vatican II ptsd on the other so getting through, getting past those two things a little bit to get more to the root of the issues and move past and uh, move past this this crisis for the sake of our children and for the sake of our dying and rapidly Marxist globalist society. <laughs> this springtime, <laughs> you know, the, the springtime uh, phrase, springtime of Vatican II. Um, <clears throat> I was reading the 1985 Extraordinary Synod of Bishops and their document going over the Second Vatican Council and their explanation about how it has not been properly implemented. There's been abuses and so on. It's a pretty good document on the whole. I did a, a show on it. Uh, but at the very end, it talks about how the, the springtime that they envisioned at the council hasn't happened yet. And I would say that's that's still true today. This whole springtime uh, era, yeah, uh, I haven't seen it yet. So <laughs> contrary to what some bishops tell us. Uh, the, here's one from Lyndon Preddy. Who is Tim's favorite guest and why is it Lyndon Preddy? <laughs> it's definitely Lyndon Preddy because he always has the best jokes and he always sings the best Ukrainian chant backstage. Okay. Cool, cool. <laughs> I didn't know that. Awesome. Um, here's one from Elijah. Do you think there were or are real differences between Catholics and Oriental Orthodox and Christology? Yeah, absolutely. Um, definitely, there's a great deal of heresy. So basically, um, there, there. so the three Greek schisms and the syriac so-called nestorian schism is still greek because it's all based there so much of their theology and syriac tradition is based on theodore mopsuestia translated from greek into syriac obviously saint ephraim the syrian actually reading in syriac originally but there's really three i view it as three different greek churches three different greek christologies and they're absolutely there's certainly real differences and there were and there are um, the difficulty is trying to weed out the wheat from the tares. And you can only do that by trying to, by doing that via logos. And it's really never, it's, and certain times it has come about, such as when the Syriac Christians were able to finally make contact with the West after centuries and centuries and centuries. They were finally able to make contact with the West and the West actually examined their theology and they nailed it out and they created the Chaldean Catholic Church. And I've, but then there was a split between them and the other Syriacs. So there's really no way to tell definitively 
uh, in especially in a moral sense, who really was uh, the heretic, other than the fact that they're anathematized by the ecumenical council. So insofar as they're understood heretically, they're heretics. But a lot of these men were not able to defend themselves like Theodore Mopsuesia. You know, so as far as his theology is understood by the Fifth Academic Council, it is heretical. So if it's understood the way the Fifth Academic Council understood it, it is heretical and he is a heretic. However, I would definitely assert that as based on the fact that the Syriac tradition has been reintegrated into the Catholic Church, there is a way to understand Theodore Mopsuestia in an orthodox sense. And I mean, this is this is peanuts compared to the type of gymnastics that people are trying to do nowadays with all the crazy statements from the Holy See and the Vatican Pontifical Council for who knows what. Uh, I mean, this stuff is like very nuanced things that are, it's like a breath of fresh air when we're trying to resolve these differences compared to the differences we're dealing with today. So yeah, but uh, yeah, Elijah, I, I'd say, yes, definitely there's heretics, um, but there's difficulties trying to weed that out and it was never really hammered out in a, in a satisfactory way because the schisms were never healed. Hmm. Uh, Ryan Pope asks, if an ecumenical council was called by secular authority, authority today, would or Oriental, I'm sorry, Eastern Orthodox be bound to accept it, regardless of whatever geopolitical concerns might manifest? What do you think here on this topic? There is nothing that an Eastern Orthodox is bound to accept except for the Seventh Ecumenical Council, and anyone who says otherwise does not understand Eastern Orthodoxy. There is didn't been a dispute since the Seventh Ecumenical Council as to what is binding on all the Eastern Orthodox since that time, and Eastern Orthodox say continually, "Well, the Eastern Orthodox Church teaches this; it teaches that; it teaches this." And the best example, the best argument that there is anything binding on the Eastern Orthodox Church beyond the Seventh Ecumenical Council is Palamas, but. Even with Palamas, there's disputes about in which manner are the essence and energies understood. Is it a formal? Is it a material? In what way is it? There's not a clarification. So there's nothing that binds Eastern Orthodox beyond the Seventh Academic Council. That is why I converted away from it, because I realized that it, it has lost the apostolic authority. So that's what I would say. Now, Greeks and Russians will be commenting right now in the chat that I don't know anything about Eastern Orthodoxy, but um, the difficulty is that the English sources are also um, based on certain mentalities or certain schools of thought. There's so many different schools of thought in Eastern Orthodoxy, as well as the other Orthodox churches in the East. So there is not a binding council because all you need to say is, well, is um, is the Council of 1666 binding on all Orthodox? Um, is the Council, uh, the Bulgarian Schism, 1870, who was right in that and why? Why was that binding on the church? You ask these tough questions to Eastern Orthodox, they have no answer and they will continually divide over what is binding and what is not. So there's no answer to the question. There's nothing binding. It's a continual dispute be among the Eastern Orthodox. Uh, Gregory asks, Timothy, do you discuss St. Gregory of Nazianzus's role in theologizing the Logos as Rom Romanitas? Romanitas? I, I don't deal deeply with anybody um, like that. Unfortunately, I have one comment, St. Gregory Nazianzus, when he comments on the elevation of um, the, the elevation of Constantinople. Now, what I think you're getting at is that there is a sacred concept of Rome. And this is, this is the concession that I, I didn't have time to make to any objections to what I've said here. And there, there is a sacred concept of Rome because the church understood, they realized that the incarnation had happened right when Caesar Augustus had ascended. This is what, if you read the martyr, Roman martyrology for Christmas, you see this plain as day. The church understood that there was a providential character to uh, Romita, uh, Romanitas. So Romanitas meaning uh, Romanity or Romanness. And this is what I'm trying to discuss here. This Romanness, which is the Greco-Roman logos, the ordering of society, which God providentially put together and then melded it with mosaic culture by means of the logos incarnate. That is what created Christian society. So no one really disputes, uh, except for maybe 
um, some Protestants, perhaps. Catholics and Orthodox agreed that the Roman, Romanitas, Romanness, the Roman Empire was used by God providentially. It was chosen by God providentially. The Greek Empire was chosen by God providentially to be used for the gospel. Now, I believe the Persian Empire was also chosen by God, but through human sin, that never came to fruition. Now, really, every people is chosen by God to a certain, to every, you know, their particular vocation and whatnot. But Rome in particular, in a particular way, um, was chosen by God. And that's the, the most important concession that we need to make because it also happens in the West with the Holy Roman Emperor. He's still, even in World War I, he's even lost the title of Roman Emperor, but he's still acting with a certain instinct to try to act as this Western Roman Emperor to try to bring about a unity during World War I. So um, I don't think I really addressed St. Gregory Nanziensis. Uh, perhaps you can send me any uh, summary and discussion of, of his views, but I would wager that that's what he's getting at. Uh, Noah asks, does the Syriac filioque make any reference to eternal procession of the Holy Spirit? In other words, is it about the eternal manifest? I'm sorry, eternal procession, I should say, yeah. not manifestation. Uh, or is it about, you know, some kind of temporal procession? Yeah, the distinction between the eternal and the, uh, to my knowledge, that actual distinction comes out of Greek polemics against Tell me if I'm wrong, if, if I'm right about that. I'm pretty sure that it comes really out of the Council of Lyon number two, when Blacerne, they're trying to debate against the filioque, and they're trying to make this distinction. Well, okay, we'll give them the filioque, but it's only temporal. Well, I think that that, um, that really is an invention to try to disprove the filioque. And so it's an invention of the, the enemies of a filioque apostolic tradition. And so, no, there's no Syriac mention of an interior procession the same way as there is um, with the Latin. Um, these are just in the Latin term, um, procesio, uh, procedit, filioque, doesn't, uh, it's so vague, it has no uh, ability to even distinguish that. Only the Greek can even make a distinction like that in the Ekparevsis. Uh, I don't know Syriac, so I can't comment on the actual uh, language, unfortunately, but... No, there's no distinction. It seems like Photius makes the, the distinction um, between temporal and eternal. Okay. And, and Blacker is about, you know, more an eternal manifestation. But I, I, I get what you're saying because I think what they're having to do is they're having to dance around the idea that the filioque is taught in church by church fathers so they're having to come up with distinctions that don't exist in the fathers themselves uh necessarily i don't know um what do, what do you think Eric? well i mean you have saint cyril of alexandria referring to the economy uh temporal economy um but he doesn't really tie it to you know that the procession of the holy spirit is only uh, to be understood in that sense. So, um, you know, you have the concept of the economy and the theologia, basically, you know, the ad intra, ad extra distinction there. But yeah, I think I agree with you, Michael. I think that Photius is really the first to really make a big deal that that is what, that's how we should, are supposed to understand both the scripture, John 15, and the other fathers who say, uh, that the that the spirit comes out of the sun, um, you know. He he wants to interpret it as a temporal procession, um, but he, even when he comes to to admit that maybe some of the fathers did teach an eternal procession, um, he he like kind of like Mark of Ephesus um, said, well, look, you know, maybe the fathers were wrong, you know, which which was surprising. It's really surprising. And this goes back to the the big schools in the East, which are the Antiochian school and the Alexandrian school. And that's the that's the conflict we couldn't even have time to talk about. But that's the origin of the Oriental Orthodox and the Eastern Orthodox and also the Syriacs, because the Syriacs follow the Antiochian, Theodore Mopsiosia. Um, but the Alexandrian school is far more influential on the West, uh, where in terms of the filioque. Um, that's why you have the Athanasian Creed, for example. Um, you have this Al Athanasian um, Alexandrian tradition, which does not use the terms logos, hypostasis uh, in the same way as the Antiochians do. 
and these different Greek terminologies, that's why Greek is so deep. That's the real, that's the origin of the filioque controversy because the Cappadocian school, especially under uh, Damascene codifying, uh, doesn't have that same Greek terminology to have an eternal procession in the same way. And that's why understandably they would be offended by it, but they're just following their own local school. I don't uh, see any more questions about the book. Uh, well, one is about whether or not you're going to have it uh, done as an audio book. Uh, God willing, uh, that'd be up to Tan, I guess. Um, mm -hmm. I'll see if I can do that. We'll see. Awesome. Good having you back on. It's been a while. I, yes, I really appreciate you coming on and do, <laughs> doing this. You're welcome on anytime, whatever topic you want to do. Thanks, brother. Appreciate that. I, I love the work you do at Reason and Theology. Uh, everyone subscribe. It's, in my opinion, the best channel out there. So you're doing great work. Keep up the great work. Thank you. And likewise, everybody check out Meaning of Catholic. And uh, Eric, any uh, parting words there? No. Um, you know, thanks, Timothy, for coming on. And uh, I was excited when you uh, reached out and uh, proposed coming on. And uh, it was a it was a treat, like always. Likewise, brother. Likewise, brother. Awesome. Well, everybody, thank y'all for watching. I appreciate the comments and questions there, the interaction. Of course, don't forget to like and subscribe and check this out uh, or check us out at patreon.com forward slash reason and theology if you want to support us on a monthly basis and also get extra content. Till next time, God bless.